As the newly commissioned USS Squalus submarine was sunk 240 feet below the waters near the New Hampshire and Maine coast after a test run, 33 U.S. Navy sailors and enlisted men only had hours before the oxygen ran out. The rescuers had never succeeded in retrieving any survivors below 20 feet, and hundreds of men had been lost in submarine accidents from 1910 to 1939. So when a team of elite diving rescuers rushed to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on May 24, 1939, the world closely followed the unit's progress on the radio. At 10.15 a.m., boatswain's mate Martin Sibitsky put on 200 pounds of diving gear, including a 40-pound ballast around his waist, and dove into the ocean. Throughout the day, the team attempted the most incredible and complex submarine rescue in history, using state-of-the-art technology. As thousands of people anxiously waited for the best possible outcome, the U.S. Navy's experimental diving unit raced against time, the weather, the darkness, and their own fears. A Mighty Sub In the late 1930s, with war brewing in Europe and Asia, U.S. military leaders began to bolster America's defenses before the conflict reached them. With an armament that included eight torpedo tubes, one three-inch deck gun, and two 50 caliber machine guns, the USS Squalus submarine was part of the U.S. Navy's effort to protect the oceans. A diesel-electric submarine, Squalus, named after a type of shark, was over 300 feet long and had a top surface speed of 20 knots, eight when submerged. She was commissioned on March 1, 1939, only six months before the invasion of Poland that sparked World War II. Only a week after entering service, USS Squalus, with Lieutenant Oliver F. Naquin in command, began a series of 18 test dives off Portsmouth, New Hampshire, with successful results. Then, on the early morning of May 23rd, Naquin, four officers, 52 enlisted men, and three civilians left Portsmouth and headed down the Piscataqua River for the 19th test dive. However, the dive would be anything but routine. Emergency. When the submarine was floating just off the Isle of Shoals moments after submerging, the crew positioned the ship into a steep dive and leveled off at 60 feet, successfully launching the test. Suddenly, a sailor in the engine room loudly screamed over the battle phone, quote, take her up. For reasons that have never been determined or disclosed, the engine's main air induction valve failed to close correctly, allowing seawater to quickly gush into the aft compartments. The team tried to close the induction valve and simultaneously pump oxygen into the ballast tanks to try and lift the submarine, but despite a slight lift, the pressure increased in a matter of seconds as the men attempted to seal leaks in the ventilation lines. After shutting down the submarine's batteries before they exploded, with torrents of water quickly flooding the battery compartment, the ship suddenly went dark. Eight sailors trying to escape made it through the watertight doors of the operating compartment, and the crew sealed it mere seconds before a full flood, locking 26 men inside. Within minutes, USS Squalus came to rest keel on the ocean floor, 240 feet below the waves. The oxygen was limited, and Naquin advised the crew to sit, relax, and calm down despite the utter darkness. The leader estimated a maximum of 48 hours before running out of oxygen, and ordered to fire a series of smoke rockets to act as distress signals, as well as a marker buoy sent up to the surface with a phone inside. The ploy was successful and caught the attention of her sister ship, USS Sculpin, which had already been dispatched to locate the missing submarine. But just as the Squalus and Sculpin skippers were about to make contact through the phone, a sudden swell snapped its cable, severing all communications. The greatest submariner in the Navy. Before 1939, no successful recovery efforts of a sunken submarine past 20 feet had ever been successful. USS Squalus was 240 feet underwater. With no time to lose, the Navy called for the experimental diving unit, led by legendary Lieutenant Commander Charles Swede Momsen. According to American journalist and author Peter Moss, Momsen was, quote, an extraordinary combination of visionary, scientist, and man of action. Many would say he was the greatest submariner the Navy ever had. Graduate of the Naval Academy, Momsen was a maverick amongst the ever strict service and one of the first sailors in the late 1910s to believe that submariners trapped in deep waters could be rescued. 
Inspired by many unfortunate submarine incidents, Momsen devoted his military career to saving other sailors' lives. The legend was already famous for building the Momsen Lung, an emergency underwater breathing device already being used by the crew of Squalus. However, he now had a new invention, a diving bell. Known as the McGann Rescue Chamber, the pear-shaped steel device had been in development for over a decade and had never been used in real scenarios. Still, Momsen and his team of elite divers would have to try. The following morning, the crew of the experimental diving unit arrived at the scene aboard the rescue vessel USS Falcon after a storm set the team back for hours. As newspapers across the world issued special bulletins reporting on the effort, thousands of people around the world sat by the radios to follow the dramatic rescue of the USS Squalus crew. Rescuing Survivors As USS Falcon moored directly over the sunken submarine just before 10 a.m., the sky was clear and the sun was out. Taking it as a good omen, the members of the experimental diving unit, led by rescue expert Swede Mumpson, got to work. One rescue diver first descended the 240 feet and landed right on top of Squalus, gently tapping the escape hatch to let the crew know that help was on the way. By then, some sailors were becoming sick from leaked gases, and desperation was setting in. It took 40 minutes to lower the cable that would be used by the diving bell, and another 22 for the diver to attach it to the Squalus's escape hatch, as the water pressure made it extremely difficult to perform any task. After securing the diving bell's cable to the hatch of the forward torpedo room, the members of the experimental diving unit slowly began to lower the device, 10 feet high and 7 feet wide, with two men inside. After 30 minutes, the bell finally reached Squalus. The rescuers then made a watertight seal on the escape hatch, and the pair of sailors inside the device opened it and immediately handed hot soup to the struggling crew. Never ones to shy away from joking, even under the most arduous of situations, one sailor immediately yelled back, quote, Where in the hell are the napkins? Diving Trips Naquin quickly detected the weakest men, and those seven were the first to be loaded into the rescue chamber. At 2 p.m., the first batch of sailors broke the surface after spending over an entire day at the bottom of the ocean. Knowing how unpredictable the New England weather was, the second trip consisted of nine sailors instead of seven, surfacing at about 4 p.m., followed by another nine on a third trip. During the fourth and final trip with eight men, including Nikwin, the bell stopped during the ascent at 160 feet as the cable holding it was fouled. Momsen was forced to cut it, letting the full bell travel back to the sand, then reattaching a cable and beginning the ascent again. After four and a half hours, the final diving bell trip concluded, with the rescue team having effectively retrieved 33 sailors from the sunken submarine. USS Sailfish With undeniable courage and intrepidity, the operation to rescue the USS Squalus survivors was a resounding success. Enlisted divers William Batters, Orson L. Crandall, James H. McDonald, and John Mialowski subsequently received the Medal of Honor for their actions, and other awards for everyone involved in the operation included 46 Navy Cross decorations and one Distinguished Service Medal. The U.S. Navy then decided to raise USS Squalus in mid-1939. Squalus was a brand new vessel with many state-of-the-art design features, so there was much curiosity about the reasons behind the unfortunate incident. As such, Swede Momsen returned to the Isle of Shoals to salvage the sunken submarine. In a seven-week effort that involved hundreds of dives and several tries, the divers passed cabins underneath the submarine and attached pontoons for buoyancy. By September 13th, USS Squalus was towed back into Portsmouth after spending almost four months at the bottom of the ocean. Two months later, she was decommissioned, and on May 15th, 1940, she was recommissioned into the U.S. Navy with a new name, USS Sailfish. Late Career Despite the name change, the Squalus name lived on, with its wartime commanding officer even having to issue standing orders that prohibited the mention of the vessel's former name. Whoever disobeyed would be marooned at the next port of call. Still, the crew mixed the names and began referring to the boat as Squalfish, 
but stopped short after the commanding officer threatened to court-martial anyone caught using the term. Between December of 1941 and December of 1944, USS Sailfish completed 12 war patrols on the Pacific Ocean. With her bad streak of luck far behind her, Sailfish was ultimately awarded nine battle stars and one presidential unit citation. Thank you for watching Dark Seas. Don't forget to hit the bell icon to be the first to know about our new videos. And for more historical content, subscribe to this and all the channels in our Dark Documentaries family. Stay tuned.